Well, I'd like to welcome Bill Connor to the Center for the Study of Tennesseans and More. I'm Dr. Chris Magra, I'm the director for the center, and it's our mission to record and preserve veteran stories, especially veterans who are Tennesseans. Uh, Bill, welcome to the center. Can you talk to us a little bit about where you were born and, and kind of uh, tell us a little bit about that place? Sure. Uh, I was born in southeastern Virginia in the city of Hampton and any place along that area. It's just it is the history of the country in a lot of ways. So Colonial Williamsburg, Jamestown, all of that was around us. Um, the city of Hampton has the distinction of being the longest continuously English speaking settlement in North America. So that was always something they've always been proud of. Um, my mother and father went to uh, the Episcopal Church in town that was the oldest Episcopal Church in the hemisphere. So just dripping with history everywhere. Uh, big seafood town, a lot of crabbing and a lot of fishing in the area commercially and recreationally. Um, just a, a great place to grow up, great families. My sisters still live there and still have the same friends they've had uh, since they were born. So it's uh, it's just a, a good hometown to be from, for sure. And what about your parents? Uh, what did they do? Were they involved in the military? They were. My, uh, my parents were born in North Carolina, uh, in the Roanoke Rapids area. And most of those towns in that part of North Carolina were kind of mill driven. So they both worked in textile mills. And if you weren't in the textile mills, you were in the paper mills. And uh, my dad had worked in the mills. My mother had worked in the mills. My dad and a couple of his cousins, actually, um, when World War II broke out, they said, we can wait to be called or we can take a little more control ourselves. So they all ran and joined the Army Air Corps. And so he was a waste gunner and radio man B-24s yeah. and thankfully came back in, in one piece, uh, was in a number of crashes and a number of close calls and things like that. And like many military people from that era, never really talked much about it at all until I joined. And then once I joined the military, it was kind of like it opened the lock. And then we had a lot of stories to compare after that. And so it was kind of a, a, a richer relationship as far as his military time so once I joined. So you grow up um, hearing lots of stories and but you still knew your dad was in the military and exactly. think that that influenced your decision to, to join the military it didn't influence my decision to join but once i decided to join i definitely wanted to be in the air force because he had been in the air corps and so there was a, a, a definite bond there um what got me to the military uh, just kind of a, a strange little path my wife and i were travel agents coming into the early 90s you were married married by then yep yep and um we're coming up on about the one year mark in our travel business that we co-owned with some folks and when desert storm started travel stops people stay home they're not going anywhere so you had to take a good hard look at where you were going to go next what we were going to do and during the time that we'd been travel agents this was in uh, Richmond, Virginia, and there was a small, it's not there anymore, but there was a, a small television station that was called BLAB, Basic Local Audience Broadcasting. And it started with this lawyer who had a, a really smart idea. He leased a cable channel five nights a week, and then he filled that channel with live call-in talk shows. And it was anybody that wanted a show. So restaurants had a cooking show, there was a NASCAR show, a uh, team of lawyers did a call in law show, um, anybody that came up with an idea. And I found out that to buy a half hour show cost about the same as what it used to cost to buy that little ad in the Sunday paper advertising your cruises. And I thought, well, why don't, why don't we look into television? And so just kind of thrown into it, I started doing a, a live cruise travel talk show. Had a lot of fun with it, it was great. But once travel kind of tapered off, my wife and I just kind of made a list of, OK, we can do anything we want to. What are the priorities? And I wanted to finish college. She had already finished. I hadn't finished college. And. I put down that I wanted to finish college. I wanted to see the world and I kind of like to maybe actually learn to be a broadcaster. 
And she just looked at it and smiled and turned her piece of paper around and all it said was see the world. She wanted to travel. We didn't have kids at the time and we thought this could be that time. And uh, I walked into an Air Force recruiter's office and I said, um, I don't know what you call it in the military terms, but Robin Williams, good morning, Vietnam. That's the job I want. And thankfully the recruiter went, cool. I've never put a broadcaster in before. Let's see if we can make it happen. So they did. And now that that was the start of, of my military career. Now, what got you from that list making with your wife to the recruiter's office? Did you and your wife have a conversation about military service? Did you talk to your parents about it ahead of time? Or did you just wake up one morning and think, I'm going to go over there and sign on? Well, you kind of take a look at what, what could check all those boxes. And I knew they had something in the way of broadcasting. I knew about the GI Bill. And I assumed if you were a broadcaster, there was going to be some overseas opportunities. And so it, it just kind of made sense to, us to look in that direction. And so I, I just made the appointment, talked to my parents. Of course, they parents, of course, they thought it was a great idea. Um, and my wife was all for it. Uh, we both have a lot of military in our background. Her father was uh, a pilot and also an air guard pilot. Her grandfather, when he passed away, he was the oldest living, second oldest living naval aviator. He had served in World War II, served in the Korean War, lived to be well over 100, so a lot of military background. So that part wasn't a hard choice. That wasn't really anything that we hesitated on. And so you entered the military, the, and the Air Force seemed to be okay with you wanting to, to be a broadcaster. Yes, yes. And did you immediately go into training for Broadcasting? Yeah, yeah. How did when, that work? Well, you finish your, your technical training, and there's a couple of different paths that people come in. You know, when you come into basic, some people are listed under what they call open general. So it's the military is going to help you find the best fit and go. And I was very set on wanting to be a broadcaster. So I was under, I think they call them guaranteed jobs. So that's your training. You've got the scores. That's where you're going to go. So once you finish your basic training, you go to whatever technical school is going to train you for that. And at the time, uh, the Defense Information School was at um, Fort Benjamin Harrison in Indianapolis. And it's all branches, including the Coast Guard. You go to school together, and it's just like you take a, a seriously crash course in college type of broadcasting. So you start with um, learning how to write radio news script, you learn how to organize news script to where you prioritize the news of the day by what's most important. We, we you, you never hear the term anymore, but there used to be a term of ripped from the wires because the AP had this machine that's just cranking out news, and when you went and grabbed the paper, there was a wire across it. So you ripped it from the wires, and we'd have to take that news copy, cut it and paste it into the priority stories of the day, and if it said, produce a five-minute newscast, that didn't mean five minutes and two seconds. That meant five minutes because you're on the clock. And so you spend time doing that. And the whole time you're learning to do that, you've got a voice and diction professor, and he is like this, scrutinizing everything you're doing. So by the time you finish that, you know how to produce news, and you know how to more or less speak properly by the time you're done. That's pretty nerve-wracking if somebody listen to you talk yes. and correct your diction. Yes, yeah. and he was extremely hard. His name was Mr. Runda, and everybody would refer, refer to it as being Runda-sized. And he would do things like, um, if, if I came in that day and I turned in my news copy a couple of minutes late, and you turned in your news copy a few minutes late, well, for that day, you and I have to carry a hockey stick around all day long to include trips to the bathroom, to include having lunch. So. It was, uh, it was hilarious, but you didn't make that mistake twice because it was just aggravating. Um, and then it's, it's every aspect of media. Once you've done those, then you went into uh, news gathering. So now you're learning how to take a camera, go out and shoot a story, shoot an interview, come back, write the script, edit the story, and crank it out. And you would learn the differences in a feature type five minute story or a hard news minute to a minute and a half, things like that. Now was part of that training what you could include and what you couldn't in that information gathering? Yes. Yeah. Um, you, you start to learn that there are always going to be mitigating factors. There's always going to be some level that you, you don't get past. 
but at the time, it's kind of the, the backward side of college. Uh, I'm sure if you talk to broadcasters and, and journalism students here, they tell you you learn a whole lot of theory and you get a little bit hands-on. In the military, you get all the hands-on and then later on you start to learn why you're doing things this way. And then finally, your, your last course is you learn television operations. So you go into a studio and you do newscasts all day long. So first you're on this camera, then you're on this camera, then you're the floor director, then you're the anchor, then you're the sportscaster, then you go up in the booth and you're running the graphics or you're running the sound and you just did that all day long until you had some tactile feel for running the different parts of the station. That was about a three-month course, and then from there you go to your, your first duty session. Now, when you're in Indianapolis, was your wife there with you, or no. did she stay in Virginia? No, when you're at your technical schools, you're by yourself. Okay. So that was her still in Virginia. Um, it was one of the, the the first real tastes we got of just how, how convoluted things can get because uh, we get our first assignment, and we're all excited because we, just any place with an adventure was great for us. And I get my orders, and I'm, we're going to Iceland. And I'm like, oh my gosh, this is so cool. Land of fire and ice, it's going to be awesome. So I've called my wife, she's all excited. She's put in her notice for work that when we're done, we have to move, all these things are going to happen. And one day I, I passed one of the administrative guys in the hall, and uh, he said, hey, you got your orders, didn't you? I said, yeah. And without even coming to a stop, he goes, oh, you know that's a one-year remote tour, which means you're going for a year by yourself. And I just, you feel your chest seize up, and I went, you, you left that part out. You didn't tell me that. So now from absolute euphoria to just the worst is that I'm going to finish this, and I've got to leave my wife for a year. Went through the entire course, or half the course, thinking that's the way it was going to be, through holidays, going home for the holidays, misery, hating it. And the week that we're scheduled to graduate, a uh, phone call comes in and it's from my sponsor. And your military sponsors are, if you're going to go to a new base, this guy's going to look out for you. They make sure that your orders go through. They make sure that your stuff is in the works as you're getting ready to come. And he said, Where, where's your housing request? And I said, why would I have a housing request if I'm not bringing the family? He said, who in the world told you that? He goes, give me the phone. And it turns out, complete old information, completely wrong. And the guy says, so so you would be willing to do two years in Iceland? I said, dude, I'll do four years in Iceland if I get to take my wife. So that quick, orders get changed. She has to drive to Indianapolis to get medically cleared. And then we're packed up and, and we finally made it to Iceland. So that was, that was the entry. I was going to ask you how hard it was to have that three months apart from your wife. Um, and whether that was the longest you had been apart from her. Oh, definitely. Yeah, because we I don't think we'd been married two or three years yet. I mean, Gosh. we were still fairly new married. Newly and yeah. we were separated for three months, and now you're facing Iceland and all yeah. the year. Yeah, that part was hard because yeah. for some reason she was very busy with work. Of course, I'm up to my eyeballs in schoolwork. So that, that part wasn't hard. And just by luck, it fell on um, the fall time of the year. So when it got to Thanksgiving, school shuts down, they send us home for a few days. Comes to Christmas, school shuts down, they send us home for a while. So we were still connecting about once a month. That part wasn't hard at all, really. But when they're telling you, yeah, you're you're going to the great unknown for a year by yourself, that wasn't fun. Yeah. Nope. <laughs> so what was Iceland like then? Did, did, did you and your wife enjoy your time there? We did. It was... Well, you get really excited about your first duty station anyway, because everything you touch is brand new. So the job part of it, everything was fascinating, everything was great. And Iceland is, is like, it's almost like living in a video game, because it really is snowing a huge part of the time, and we saw snow thunderstorms, we saw the northern lights, we toured glaciers in the summertime, it never got dark. Um, amazing wonderful people, some of the loveliest people we've ever known, um, like a zero percent crime rate because just too small and too few people and everybody was the same economically, everybody was the same as far as jobs, all those things that can make friction they just didn't have at the time. So we just fell in love with the place and we realized we must have been having a good time because a typical work week if you were a broadcaster there you'd easily work 50 to 60 hours a week. What were you doing? 
You go in phases. Your first one, they put you on television board up. So you're keeping TV on the air at night or all day as well. And in these days, just picture a wall of very specialized uh, videotape holders. So cassettes about this big that would hold everything from movies to TV shows. And remember now, this is early 90s. So the way that we got our television is huge boxes would show up and you're getting tapes of all the hit TV shows from all the channels. So our Monday night lineup would be, you know, three sitcoms and we got to wait for Monday night football to come over the satellite because of the time difference. But my job at the beginning was loading up all these VCRs, getting them queued up just right. And then like you see in a lot of movies where you're pushing buttons and doing this with fader switches and you're putting and taking TV off the air. And from there, you either go into radio or news. But by the time you're done with those two years, you've spent time in, in all three areas. So we got to do really great, really fun um, television news stories where we're, uh, our, our Icelandic rescue squadron would have to get into helicopters and go out to boats when people were sick or if there had been some type of an accident. And we'd get to fly along with them and shoot those kind of things. And then radio was just an incredible amount of fun, you, just what you would hope it would be, because you got to do the news reporting that you had spent so much time on. You got to um, produce commercials and spots and things like that. And and then if you just had an idea, as long as it fit the rules, it was it was pretty cool. And I, I knew the military was going to be a lot more fun than I expected when they let me start doing a, a Grateful Dead radio show on Saturday nights. And the first award I ever won in the military was for playing Grateful Dead music, and I went, I think this is going to work. I think this is going to be very uh, uh, much much more than what I thought it was going to be. So you did radio, you did TV, you did kind of a mixture of both when you were there in Iceland. Mm -hmm. and, and news, and, and news reporting. And news reporting as well. And all of that is for the military community. It's not meant for outside consumption, is that correct? That's, you just made a great point. The whole purpose of the job is to put English-speaking media in places where you don't normally speak English. But you do have a shadow audience, and it's an important shadow audience because when you asked me earlier about are you learning about how you have to tell a story, you know, you can tell a story that shares information, or you can share a story in a way that makes it inflammatory, or you can do a crappy job of it and tell a story that's not right. So everything we did, we, we tried to keep it very simple and very mild. We weren't trying to grab a headline. We weren't trying to do anything more than inform the people on the base with respect to our Icelandic host because it was a very good relationship and you just didn't want to do something stupid to mess it up. Uh, it, it happened before I got there, but um, there used to be a, a radio, kind of a radiothon to raise money for um, support relief organizations. And they had a great catch-all where, let's say you put on a song and you and I work together and you pay $10 to play that song. Well, I can have fun with it and I can pledge $15 and I can bump your song off the air. So it's all in good fun and it raises more money and more money and more money. Well, the Marine Corps, they would start every hour by pledging $200 for the Marine Corps hymn. And since that was the highest dollar song, it would get played at the top of every hour. So for the entire Radiothon, the Marine Corps hymn gets played at the top of every hour. Well, one year, a bunch of people got together, local Icelandic civilians, and they were ready for this. And they pledged a huge pile of money for the Icelandic National Anthem to lead the top of the hour. What do you think happened next? A bunch of Marines and other people thinking this is all in fun, well, you bumped the national anthem of your host country. And we didn't just bump songs, you know, we had a, a sound effects thing that sounded like a scratching record when you stopped it. So in the middle of a national anthem, you hear, and then you yank it off the air. So something that tame was a true international incident. People had to make calls and answer to that. So you always had to be cognizant of 
you're not just talking to your base buddies. You're talking to a bigger audience, and you've got to make sure you do that just right. And now, how much of your job was Air Force, and how much of your job was serving the military community in Iceland? Well, in Iceland, you didn't have an Icelandic military, okay. so you had uh, the the station was manned according to the manning of the base. It was a, a NATO facility, so you had a couple of little detachments from other countries. You had uh, primarily a Navy audience. It was a, a naval air station, Keflavik, part of this NATO facility. So because it was mostly Navy with an Air Force fighter squadron, because you still had the uh, Cold War going on, and then you had a Marine detachment, so our makeup at our radio and TV station reflected that. Most of the people in the station were Navy, with Air Force people in proportion to that. So you're always working for the whole military when you're doing the job. And after ISIL, uh, were you given a, a, your pick of where to go? <laughs> and did you and your wife talk about where you wanted to go from ISIL? Well, once we got settled in in Iceland, we knew two things. One, we had no intention of getting out of the military until it, until they made us. And the other thing was, we loved being overseas. And we knew we were going to stay overseas as long as we possibly could. So the way you do assignments is you, you've got a form that's called a dream sheet. And you've always got a list of places where you would like to be assigned. And the, the catchphrase is, the needs of the Air Force comes first. So they're going to put you where they need you, but they'll try to accommodate if they can. And They'd like to keep you in the Atlantic, or at least in Europe, because that's what you're closest to. And when I started looking at assignments, um, it's not a political thing, but we're a small enough career field at the time that the people who ran the show knew who was at the different detachments. They knew which detachments were strong, which deta detachments could use help. So if you're doing well, they're going to try to steer you to a place that maybe could use some help, and maybe you're going to help lift the place up a little bit. That's great, but that can keep you out of some... It's like the harder you work, the more you may not get to some of the really fun assignments. And we tried very hard to get to a uh, base in Aviano, Italy. And there was openings, they tried to get us there, but they were a strong detachment and they were doing fine. So they could send us to a number of Army detachments but we couldn't get that base. We just, you know, we just spent two years on a Navy base. I'd kind of like to go work for the Air Force now. And so we heard of this place called the Azores. And if you look on a map, start with Portugal and come out into the ocean, there's a little string of islands out there. And Tercera is one of the islands that's um, a Portuguese air base with an air detachment that provides fuel for military planes going back and forth. The island is 10 miles wide, 20 miles long. Um, not, it's not that it wasn't modern, but it was definitely old world to where you had modern roads coming back and forth from the island, but when you would go off into the little villages, there were still cobblestone streets and it was not at all uncommon for a guy to be leading his cattle through the street to get to the next field to go graze them and things like that. So it definitely was a step back. Um, and it was a blast. Just a, a great place. It was warm outside, very um, kind of a manana feeling to where, yeah, we'll get to that. It may not happen today, but because why would they hurry? There's no need to hurry on this island. So we went from a very modern European cosmopolitan feeling place that was very expensive to a very old world, relaxed, very inexpensive place. And was the base that way? Was the base relaxed and, and was the culture in the in broadcasting there more relaxed than Iceland? No, the the culture stays the same because regardless of where you put it, there's a mission that has to be done and it has to be done right. Um, it felt more relaxed because the weather was nice almost all the time. Everybody's in t shirts and shorts if they're not working. Huge emphasis on family activities, which just made the place feel very comfortable too. Um, but the the broadcasting, we still had to stay sharp, but we still could have a lot of a lot of fun at the same time. And when I got there, uh, 
they told me that I was going to be the, the morning disc jockey, which is just like here in the States, that's a fun job. That's You're kind of driving the way the day is going to go. And uh, the show was called Breakfast with Bill. And during the week, it's a mix of shows, Fridays, oldies. Um, so you, you really start to get that feel of, it's, it's not a celebrity thing, but you get to know what it feels like because everywhere you go, everybody in your base knows who you are by name. And it's got its perks when you walk in to get your mail. It's, uh, hey, Bill, thanks for playing that song for us this morning. We got something for you. As opposed to everybody else walking in on box number 27, you know. So you, you get used to that because the, the community was such a smaller, tighter group. Um, going out to eat dinner together, spending weekends together, just those kind of things, very common because it was just very conducive to doing that kind of stuff. Um, How long were you in the, in the Hayes Wars? That was another two year Simon. Okay. And so are we out of the 90s yet? No, still in the 90s. Okay. This was this was roughly uh, 92, 93 in Iceland, 94, 95 in the Azores. Okay. So we're coming up on, on close to 96 at this point. And, and what did your wife think about the Azores? She loved it. Uh, did she, is she doing any travel business in, while she's at Iceland or while she's No, we, we completely got out of all of that. Okay. Um, she was, uh, my, my wife is just, kind of a, a worker's dream. She's just a rock star as an employee in general. So when we got to Iceland, she started working for the Extension School for the University of Maryland there. Loved working. Because on most the University of Maryland had an Extension School in Iceland. Well, most of your military bases, they have yeah. um, schools on campus. Yeah. And so uh, University of Maryland has a huge international campus. Oh, I can't remember. Somewhere in Germany. So that extension is really an extension of the European division, so they had a school there. So she worked there. And when we got to um, the Azores, she worked as the high school secretary. Uh, so just great, fun jobs that she enjoyed thoroughly. Um, so she, she's an, an adventurer just like me. She loves to travel, lots of wanderlust. We're still that way today. And so being in a place like this, it opened opportunities that you just you realize you get used to it, and then you tell somebody else, and it sounds ridiculous. Like the way that military moves around, they call them rotator flights. So, say so you've got orders, and you're going to be stationed in the Azores. So you're going to go to Philadelphia. The rotator flight is going to take a group of people. They're going to stop in the Azores. People are going to get off. They're going to fly to Avion, Italy. They're going to get off. They're going to go to Turkey. People are going to get off. Then they come back and pick people up and go back. Well, if you understand how that process works, that means when the plane lands on Friday night in the Azores, when all those people get off, you can go on leave status and jump on. So now you fly to the next stop, Aviano, Italy. So you get off, go jump on the train, take the train down to Venice, ride the canals for the day, drink wine, eat pizza, load up your backpack with pasta, when the plane comes back that night, you jump back on and fly back home, and you get Sunday to sleep it off. And we called it the spaghetti run because it was like a one-day trip, cost absolutely nothing, to go to Italy for the day. And you think, this is ridiculous. This is yeah. like made up. Yeah. And it was that was a pretty common thing there. So you got neat little adventures like that out of it. Now at this point, when you're at the Azores, Bill, I'm sensing, a, I'm still sensing a lot of excitement. I'm still yes. sensing that at this point, the the military and broadcasting are still. Uh, still in your heart. Oh yeah, very much so. Yeah, absolutely. So, what were you and your wife talking about after the Azores? Well, when you when you've decided you're going to do a military career, your your biggest thought is, I wonder what the next assignment's going to be. Where are we going next? What's going to happen after that? And um, did you think about the promotions? I I guess I did. Because everybody does, but I don't know. It wasn't that, that's driving a, your decision. Maybe. No, no. It never drove a decision as far as like where we were going to go. It, that was never a part of it. The, when you're doing work that is that much fun, I mean, think about jobs. Uh, you know, people 
there's a reason why people don't make a lot of money to work in radio. It's because it's so much fun, they'll do it for almost nothing. So think of working in radio or TV, and there's no pressure for ratings, there's no pressure for ad sales, you're just doing journalism, you're just doing entertainment radio for your base audience, you're, you're just doing the job that you would love to be doing, and it's great. I mean, it, so the, the next thing you're always thinking of, well, I gotta go somewhere, where am I going next? That's, that's pretty much what drove us each What time. was after the Israelis? Well, we had hoped again, as we finished up there, that um, there'd be an assignment that would get us to mainland Europe, and there just, there wasn't, there just wasn't anything. And uh, a friend of ours uh, at the station had applied for this job, and he didn't get it, and he was kind of disappointed, you know, kind of disappointed, and we're just shooting breeze one day at his house. I still remember we were over there doing this. And he said, um, he said, Bill, there's this job that I, I really think you need to apply for. I think you would really love this. And he said, no, it's in Texas. And I'm like, we don't want to go to Texas. We're, we're overseas. We're, we're, we're overseas people. He's he goes, worse than Texas. Yeah, yeah. He goes, well, well, hear me out on this. So the job was to go to uh, San Antonio, Texas, to the Air Force recruiting headquarters. And you're working in the equivalent of an advertising agency, but the Air Force is your only client. So down this hall, you've got the people who write all of the scripts, write all of the brochures, write all of the pamphlets, the, the words you read about the Air Force are coming out of this room. Next door to that are a couple of photographers that go out and shoot the pictures that are going to accompany all that text. You got another office with the guys that come up with the swag that the recruiters hand out, the t-shirts and all that kind of stuff. And then our little office, it looked just like this, except one of these rooms was a very nicely insulated recording studio. So you're a recruiter out in the field, you make the run around town, and you call me up and you say, okay, uh, I'm a new recruiter in town, and I've gone to uh, 90.1 The Rock. They're the college radio station. Okay. And then I went to WIVK, who's the sports channel. And then I went to these guys. So then I'd go in the studio and I'd record a spot. And instead of it being a generic 1 800, it's the Air Force wants you to know there's a new recruiter in town. His name is Chris Magra. His office is located on Cumberland Drive. Stop in and blah, blah, blah. Give him a call at 865 such and such. Aim high with the Air Force and aim high with UTK The Rock. Well, you go walk into that station with that, and they're going, this is the coolest thing we've ever heard. We'll play the daylights out of this for you. And I went, okay, that, that sounds kind of fun. That could be kind of cool, I guess, but I wasn't sold on it. They said, now there's one more thing you get to do. To thank the radio stations for that, every Christmas you're going to go to Nashville, and you're going to sit down with a country star, and you're going to interview them just like you and I are doing now, and we're just going to talk about Christmas when you were growing up. What did Christmas turn into when you became a big star? How does your family celebrate Christmas now? And then right on Music Road, go into a studio and take the interview, mix it with songs from whatever Christmas album they were promoting, and we would call it The Gift, and we'd send it to country music stations all over the country. The Air Force would get millions of dollars of free airplay out of um, these productions. So I did one with Randy Travis, one with uh, Clint Black, one with Trisha Yearwood, and one with Charlie Daniels. So when they told me that you, you were finding a bridge that lets you start to take these military skills and start to use them in a little bit of a commercial way, and you're starting to learn the marketing and the advertising of the Air Force, we just kind of went, that could be kind of cool. And did you like country music? Was that a draw for you too? Country music was different at the time because in those days, most people don't even realize this anymore, there was a, a space in there where country music was like the top format for 18 to 24 year old. So it was prime for the military to be so involved in country music. And in Texas, you've got all kinds of music that comes within the realm of country music. So it was just a, another place to go explore. And so we took that job. We were thinking four years, we're gonna go hang out in Texas, we're gonna do this job and it's gonna be great. And we ended up being there for 17 years. Because as soon as that assignment was wrapping up, they were going to send us back to the Azores. That, that was the orders in hand was to go back to the Azores. That was the first time we kind of went, no, that's not what we want to do. We've already done that. We want to go somewhere else. 
and through some unusual coincidences, we found out there was um, an active duty air guard slot at the um, air guard unit on the other side of town at Lackland. And I had met with them and shot some video with those guys. And they said, we, we'll make a spot for you. We'd love to have you. So when that assignment finished, I transferred from active duty Air Force to still active duty, but active duty with the guard. And so that's what put us there for, for so long. It was, uh, it was moving over to another chapter, another way to do the job. What, what about those, let's circle back to those country music legends yeah, yeah. that you got to work with. Um, was that experience going from Texas to, to Tennessee and to sit down with these these folks? Uh, what was that like? I thought it was going to be. Were you nervous the first time you did? I thought I was going to be. Yeah. And I, I never thought about this till later. But this is one of those uh, lessons you learn from your parents that you didn't realize you were learning at the time. Um, the studio that we worked in was a place called Spotland, and the guy who ran the studio uh, was a fellow named Ben Holland, still has the studio there today, and turns out he was from Virginia also, so we were brothers in arms the minute we met. And the first time I went into the studio to do the work with him, I noticed there's no awards on shelves. There's no pictures with all the buddy pictures with all the country stars that had come through there. And I just remember when I walked in the door, I just felt relaxed because it just felt like a place to come and do work. It didn't feel like <sighs> somebody in Famous is coming in the door. And he and I had a few days to talk because the first one I did was with Randy Travis. And we shot that at somebody's home in California where he, was, he used to do some acting. And he was shooting a movie called um, Boys Will Be Boys. So you went from Nashville to California, or did you go from Well, I was still in Texas, so before I'd even gotten to do any work yeah. in Nashville, the first thing was to go shoot the interview. How did that, was that a phone call? Did somebody call you and say, hey, Bill, we want you to go to California and interview Randy Travis? Well, it, it was all done pretty darn professionally. There was a an agent in Nashville that worked for the Air Force to help us do these shows. So he would go out and find the talent, and the, the criteria was, you know, obviously we want somebody that cares about the military, but we want somebody that has a relatively new Christmas album because that's what's going to push somebody listening to this show. So he would book the talent, and at the time, we booked Randy Travis, and he's shooting this movie with uh, Mickey Rooney, and the lady playing his wife, if you've ever seen the movie Airplane, Julie Haggerty, this, the flight attendant, that was his wife, and uh, Dom DeLuise was directing it. So we show up at this guy's house, and the deal is we're supposed to walk in the door, we're going to do this interview, get out of their hair, and they're going to get to work. And we walk up, meet Randy Travis, perfectly nice guy, great guy. And it's different when you meet somebody in the street in front of somebody's house instead of, you know, in some famous place. And while we're getting ready to go sit down to do the interview, somebody walks up and they said, uh, oh, Randy, um, really sorry about this. They've had to flip the whole day, so we're going to start shooting in like 10 minutes. And we're looking at each other like, well, what are we supposed to do? Because the production technician guy, the engineer, is, is standing there with me. And everybody's eyes got big, and they said, so can you hang around? We're here for you. As long as I come back with an interview, we can stay here as long as we have to. And he said, okay, we'll definitely do it today. I don't know when. Okay. So... The, the whole day was shot around this thing in the backyard of somebody's house in Hollywood. And we walk in the door and Dom DeLuise walks up. He said, hey, really sorry we had to do this to you today. We had to do it for this, blah, blah, blah. He goes, but just hang out for the day. When we break for lunch, come eat lunch with us. It'll be great. It'll be great. So now we just watch him make a movie for the day. And we're watching him shoot and cut and do this again and do this again. And, we're having a chat and it, when you see that somebody is like above and beyond present, that's when, to get back to the original question you asked, the nervousness goes away because you're made to feel a part of it. We're just having a conversation and 
Tom DeLuise walks back over and he said, man, I'm really sorry this has taken all day. He goes, hey, but uh, I, I wanted you to meet somebody that stopped by and we turn around and it's John Voight. Academy Award winning actor John Voight stopping by to see his buddy Dom and Dom says, hey, I want you to meet these Air Force guys that are out here. And John Voight comes over and shakes our hand and says hi and we chat for a minute. But just watching how they worked, what they did, they were so genuinely nice to us. It wasn't like they had to pander to us or anything, they, but they did include us. And we didn't get to shoot the interview until the end of the day. And Randy Travis was great, even though he had just been working all day. We still sat down and did a great interview. But then when we got to the studio part, um, what Ben told me was the same way that I felt when I walked in, that's what happens to recording artists when they walk in. Because when they walk in and they see this place is just a comfortable place to work, you can just see them just relax. And once they're relaxed and the guard is down and the celebrity stars are turned off, it's just some guy walking in and you're going to work with him for a while. And what made that so crazy is I'm thinking we're going to be in a studio, we're going to piece this thing together. Well, this guy's got a working studio. So while we're there, Ben Scale comes in to work on some stuff. And while we're here, these other guys come in. And we realize that while we're here, hey, let me write this up real quick. And will you do the spot for the Air Force? They're like, yeah, we'll do anything for you guys. So we're getting free spots out of the deal. And these people are walking in and being so kind about it. And so there was never any nervousness about it. Every time we dealt with anybody, they were just... They were just warm, nice, working people, happy to show some support for the military. I think maybe that was an edge to it, as they were happy to help us out. So each each encounter was great. Uh, the one with Clint Black happened in a ABC radio studios in I'm trying to think of the area that's right Burbank, right outside of Hollywood. He was going to host like the Country Music Association Awards or something. So we went out there to do the interview with him. And he was just, I mean, you felt like you knew him. When you talked with him, the, the answers were so personal. It was like you're in a kitchen talking across the table with a buddy. But they were all wonderful. So there was never any nervousness. There was never any reason for them to make us feel nervous. They were just sweet people. It was, it was a thrill. Well, I so, can see why you would want to stay involved in this for 17 years oh, absolutely. in Texas. Absolutely. Um, what got you from Texas to Tennessee? So it was not expected, it wasn't a planned thing, but at McGee Tyson at the Air Guard Base, you've got the, the tanker mission, you see our planes flying around all the time, but there's a separate mission there, there's a tenant organization called the Training and Education Center, and that's where we have some of our academies for our airmen that are about to become sergeants and for our sergeants who are about to become senior NCOs, uh, we've got academies for that. And there's also other courses going on, and one of them is the Public Affairs Manager's course. So one of the changes that I had to make coming from broadcasting in the military to the Air National Guard is in the Air National Guard, you don't have broadcasters. You have public affairs, which is just changes. You take out the broadcasting element, and now you're documenting, producing content, message managing for telling the story of the base. And this course is our ongoing like seminar and training for it. We love going to the course, and the guys who own that program picked a couple of us and said, we'd, we'd like you guys to kind of carry the ball. We want you to take over the course. So, Do you remember what year that was? Yeah. Wow. That would have been about probably 16 years ago or so, so I, I don't remember the exact year, but probably I got to the Air Guard in 2000, so I would say probably by... 2005, 2006, we were probably starting to do some of the teaching. And the course was taught three times a year. Started as a one-week course, went to a two-week course. So you're mixing with your people from the field. And, um, and this is at McGee Tyson. At McGee Tyson. And your wife have already moved. No, 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 no. This no. is this is still my regular job in Texas. Oh, okay. But three times a year, I would fly up and teach this course. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, that's important that you said that because one of the years... One of the trips fell on my son's birthday, one of the trips fell on my daughter's birthday, one of the trips fell on my 10-year wedding anniversary. Could not have made it any worse if I wanted to. And luckily, 
anniversary fell just as one of the classes was ending. And I said, I'll tell you what, why don't you guys come up here and why don't we do like the big tourist weekend? We'll go to the Smokies, we'll go to downtown Knoxville. I'll show you all this stuff that I've been telling you I love so much because I really did start to realize, you know what people are like in Tennessee, it's no joke. I'd come up here for about two and a half weeks, three times a year, so I'm spending about a month and a half of every year now up here. I knew more people here by name and face than I knew in Texas, and that's where I lived. So that says something about Tennessee. But my wife and I were driving down the main drag in Maryville, and she's just looking out the window, and she's like, I could live in a town like this. She said, this is, this place is kind of special. So moving now to 2012, um, a full-time slot opened up here. And by full-time, I mean it's what they call a, a statutory tour. It's a four-year assignment, just like you would take a four-year tour active duty. This is a four-year active duty tour, but it's to do a special job in, in a unique place. So a four-year job opened up to be an instructor. And I thought, at McGee Tyson. At McGee Tyson. So we could move. We're in the window to where we're thinking about retiring. We could make this our retirement home. And I get to learn to be an instructor and learn a whole new bag of tricks. So this was an, an Air National Guard's instructor certification course, and I would be one of the instructors teaching the course. So like everything else, real fast, and now you're teaching, and now you're teaching other people how to do it, but just another whole skill set to add to it. And, and what a great way to kind of give back as you're finishing up the military career. So the only hitch was if, um, if we could find work for my wife because once she got in the Azores as a high school teach, uh, secretary, that put her into the civil service system, the GS system. And she took to it the way I took to the military. And she had done very well civil service. By this time, she's GS-12, which is, that's real good work if you can get it. To make it even better, she had made it that far without ever having to be a supervisor, which is almost unheard of. So we just told them, this would be great. We would love to move to Tennessee, but we got to find really good work for my wife. And you wonder how stars line up sometimes because she applied out at Oak Ridge, Department of Energy picked her up, hired her so fast. She was here a month before I was even moved up here. And I remember our next door neighbor called up and he said, hey, can you, can you come by the house for a minute? Yeah, and we already knew what the conversation was going to be about. Um, a little off track here, but that exact moment in Texas, there was a lot of fracking going on, and so there was a lot of fast money coming in and a lot of people coming into the area on a not-so-permanent basis. So people would buy up houses and then rent out the other rooms. Well, we knew what he was thinking when he called us, and um, my wife said, you know what he's going to ask you? Go take care of it. I said, will do. And he said, what are you going to do about selling your house? I said, well, I hadn't really thought too much about it. And he said, what would you do with it? And I said, I'll sell it to you for what I owe on it, and I'm not even going to mow the grass. And he went, fair enough. Because I'm already thinking the time and the money you'd have to put into a house to get it ready, to put it on the market to sell it. In the meantime, we're trying to get moved to Tennessee. And I thought, if I can just cut it and be done, and we sat back and laughed at that and we said, how does that work that a dream job comes up for not just one, but for both of you, and then the last hump, selling the house, is done like that. And what ended the conversation was, oh, and um, his, this guy's daughter, who was actually really going to be the one to buy the house, oh yeah, um, uh, my daughter's college roommate is a real estate attorney, so they'll just do up all the papers and you guys won't have to pay for any of that. And so. They brought over a stack of papers. We signed a bunch of papers, and we're headed to Tennessee. You're here in Tennessee. So 2013. That's it's <laughs> been 10 years, almost to this week, that we've lived in Tennessee now, and it's home. It's it's definitely home. Uh, what a fantastic story, Bill. Um, before we end today, I wanted to be sure to get your thoughts on the media and the military. As someone who's built a career out of it, someone who's done it in a lot of different ways. Um, what do you think the media's responsibility is when it comes to the military? I, 
I wish I could give you a good answer to that, and I, I, I'm sad to say I don't think there is one anymore. Um, for for a number of different reasons, and I, I won't dig too deep because that could be another whole conversation. But I just remember when when I was learning to be a broadcaster, and boy, doesn't that sound like a lead into an old guy story in my day? Well, in my day, you learned that this is a, a craft. And you probably can still remember days when journalists were considered respected like a lawyer or a doctor. These were people that were carrying a torch to give you the truth, to make sure that you were holding politicians and leaders accountable and making sure that you were getting the straight information. So when you're overseas shooting stories that some were a lot of fun and some that were kind of silly, you always hoped, if I can learn to shoot well, if I can learn to edit well, if I can learn to do a good sound bite, if I can do what they call the stand-upper, where you're standing in front of the camera, if I can learn all those pieces, maybe someday I could come back home and I could get a job on a local TV station. That would be so cool. And you held those guys like Walter Cronkite and Peter Jennings and all those people, you held them in such high regard because you never knew what their politics were. All you knew was you were trusting them to take what they're told and turn that into the real information. You had to get three verified sources before you said something on the air. You had a, a very high esteem for that. And when you look at what that has turned into now, where Everybody has their own high-definition broadcasting device in their hip pocket 24-7. When you look at how we've sunk into a point where you don't really feel you can trust your government, you don't feel you can trust the device that's telling you what the government's doing because it's, it's, it's now overtly biased depending on who you're listening to, to what they feel the story should be. So I really don't know. What, what the media's role is nowadays. And I don't even know if back then, if when I was doing it for the military, if I could have commented on it, because again, ours was a very different type of journalism. We, there were stories that we absolutely did not touch. And I'll, I'll quickly give you an example of the one that still sticks out in my head. I got a call to come in one night, and they said, um, really don't want you to tell anybody what you're coming in for. Okay. And had to pack up my gear, go over to an office, and I was there to videotape the interview that would become the testimony of a little girl who had been sexually abused on base. If there's ever a night you want to get it right, that's the night you want to get it right. And we shot it. The uh, Office of Special Investigations, the OSI people, came back with me. We mixed the tapes so that every channel had every bit of audio so nothing could be questioned. Gave them those copies and gave them the original masters. So there was never a question of, of the continuity of getting this right and how important that was. That was never, ever, ever mentioned in news on the base. And you think, well, why wouldn't you do that? That's, that is news. It is news. But this is a little bubble of a community very, very, very far from home. And a story like that, the magnitude of it, which is one of the, the key elements of what makes something newsworthy, what's the magnitude of it? Well, this would be like a bomb going off in the middle of the space. It was too much for a story for a base that size, and it would be so disruptive and so destructive in many ways. Those kind of things were never talked about. In civilian news, nowadays, you would hope that the bomb would go off because you want to tear up everything you possibly can if it's going to get you that much more news time to cover it. So when I think of what we did and what we were trying to do and what we hoped we would do someday, and I look at what we consider our news nowadays, I just I don't get it. I, I really don't see where we've got the most advanced equipment ever. It's lighter than it's ever been. I used to walk out the door with 70 pounds of camera gear hanging on me. 70 pounds of gear. 
And that was what I had to do to shoot a news story. And I could walk out with my iPhone right now and get almost as good a quality picture as what I used to do then. So there's, there's no excuse for stories to not be shot well. And you see stuff out of focus all the time. You hear audio glitches all the time. You see so many times where they didn't give themselves enough time to go interview the subject matter expert, so they interview somebody off the street that didn't even see it, but they live in that neighborhood, so they're going to ask them a couple of questions, and you just think, this is what this turned into. What happened? We could have done so much better. This could be so good. And um, that's a very rambling answer to what you asked me, but I, I don't, uh, uh, it feels very foreign to me these days, and I, I honestly, I don't miss it. I, I loved everything that I ever did in the military. I don't think I had, I probably didn't have five bad days in 25 years. It was a wonderful career. I was proud to serve. Um, and I tell people that today, uh, when they think of joining the military, don't be confused about your motives. Uh, it's no secret that we look out for our own needs first, and then hopefully you turn into something better later. That's the way people come into the military. I came in because I wanted to see the world, and I wanted you to pay for my college, and I wanted to learn to be a broadcaster. After a while, it becomes service. After a while, it becomes patriotism. And you do start to care about getting the job done right for the people around you. And whether we were playing Grateful Dead songs in Iceland or whether we were in New Orleans for Hurricane Katrina, there's always that feeling of, we're going to shoot this right. We're going to make sure we tell the story the best we can. And I remind people, it's a, it's a heck of a lot of fun. I mean, I, I didn't do it for 25 years because it stunk. I did it because I loved it. So that part is still there, and I think that still is available. But um, yeah, it's been it's been an amazing ride, and I still do it now. I mean, I still work for the Air National Guard as a civilian. Uh, my job is called a Airman and Family Readiness Manager, and I'm coming up on my fifth year of that. So it's turning into a 30-year run of, of service, and I'm I'm still loving it. So still That's good. Great. Thank you very much, Bill. Thank you so Appreciate much. You. Pleasure to talk with you.